counting down. Good morning. Some huge snowflakes coming down outside. I was looking at as I was getting some water. All right, the countdown is over. <laughs> let's see, let's switch over here. Here we go. All right, so. Back again. The project, the one and only glowing telegram. It's been two weeks. I was not feeling up for the uh, the last Sunday coding stream, so more recovered. Still a little bit of a cough, um, but I don't think I'm at risk of my uh, <laughs> of uh, you know really bothering my throat like it was last week. Uh, talking a bunch on stream, so. Where we left off, that's kind of what I was looking at. Oh, let's turn these down a little bit. Uh, we were working on kind of a, a timeline view last time around. Thanks for coming in, by the way, Dan. Hope your morning's been going going good. Mmm, I need some more coffee. Ah, yes. Okay. So, I feel like we're still in kind of the building foundational elements stage of this project, right? So we're, we built a lot of code. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I guess the notifications do show up in this view, huh? That's not great. Oh, well, anyway, kind of in this, this like, we've, we've written some code, we've made some stuff to pull in data. And now we kind of want to develop some some UI to be able to look at that. Um, basically, we, we do want to, I, I want to get to the point where we're gonna be using AI to like essentially cut up videos to say, okay, here's where interesting thing happens uh, and then create episodes, create transcripts, create summaries, um, all, of, all of those things. But to really, I think, one, it's, it's unlikely to get to the point where it's gonna be like, you press a button and it all just works. There's going to be things where we're gonna wanna be able to re review what the proposed like cuts are. Like, um, and in order to really do that, how I was um, kind of envisioning how this would work generally is that, okay, so probably what I do is I would have something in the UI so that instead of managing the stream in Twitch, I might actually do that in here somewhere, but somehow the information about the streams would end up in as a record here. Um, and then the local recordings of the stream would be, you know, associated through video clips here to the stream. Uh, then I would be able to like click this and be like process <laughs> into episodes or something like that, right? Uh, I, uh, I clicked it. Is it loading? Yes. Okay. Um, And then you could take those episodes and say upload to, to YouTube or whatever. Um, but it's never, it, it's unlikely to be something where it's gonna be fire and forget like that. We're gonna want something where we can see what it's uh, 
Oh, right, right, right. So where I was going with this, the original idea was you would click some buttons and then it would give you uh, a file and you could open that and eventually resolve. You Like it would be something you would import and eventually resolve. Um, and then you would be able to kind of review what it suggested to have happen there because you know as a video editor it has you know a timeline it has um a ui for doing this sort of stuff so on the one hand i'm not completely certain that's going to work i have i've done a little bit of reading a little bit of research a little bit of testing um, and there are some ways to import stuff into DaVinci Resolve, like some file formats that it will import. They seem somewhat limited. I'm not 100% convinced that I will be able to create a file that has all of the things I want to have happen, like all the stuff I want to essentially script, right? So take the set of video files, slice it up this way, then uh, do an intro transition, an outro transition, add a video clip on the end that's like the, the outro video, adjust audio levels, um, add some overlays here and there, all, all the things that I, I'm doing manually in Resolve. So how to do that, uh, you know, to, to find like a, uh, a file that could be imported into Resolve that would do all those things for me is I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how feasible that's going to be. And the other thing that you could do is there is script, scripting capability in Resolve, but um, having tried to do some of it, I am kind of dubious as to whether that is going to work either um, without a lot of time and a lot of fiddling potentially only to then get to the point where I realized there are things that it still is not going to be able to do. And it's still going to require like manual adjustments every time I want to go through that workflow. So kind of the, the worst case is that I don't use resolve. Like if, if we can use AI and we have a GUI here that lets us look at um, essentially how we want to process the video, then do we really need a video editor is a question versus, um, you know, using FFmpeg and stuff and just doing it in code here. Maybe that's kind of a, a last resort, right? If we can't figure out a way to like transition from the data we have here into what gets, uh, into, into like a, a video editor could just implement um, some of that uh, in code. Um, it would not be as flexible. <laughs> I, it, it would take way too long to be as flexible as, you know, I'm not going to create a video editor um, with like the all that stuff, but for the purposes of kind of the, the videos that I'm doing and making clips and highlights and stuff, maybe that is feasible. So that's some just kind of me thinking out loud, kind of what, where we might eventually end up be. In the interim, I think it still does make sense to continue working on some of the UI elements here um, to figure out, uh, right. So last two, two weeks ago, I was working on a UI component, a timeline so that we could visualize kind of the, uh, the identified silent segments. And I think that's going to be really good to see that so that we can then um, in the short term having a visualization of the data is going to help refine what 
the microservice, the, the silence detection microservice is doing. And we can look at maybe improving. Um, I have some concerns about the quality of the data and how it's working. And so if we can visualize it, that may, it'll make it easier to understand the data so we can fine tune it, right? So alternatively, we could say, okay, let's not build any more UI. Let's just have everything dump into DaVinci Resolve. And then we'd look at it there, but that's going to mean kind of uh, any kind of working on data gathering, any, any of that stuff that's happening in the application. We're not gonna get feedback until we like import it into Resolve and look at it there. And there's just too many steps. Um, so that, that's kind of my thought process right now. So I, I have done, no, oh, that, that doesn't belong there. I have done a couple of uh, things between streams here. Um, the main thing, I did add the styled stuff that we, we added to the other UI components to the timeline. So it'll be easier to add some uh, CSS. And um, I think more importantly, one of the things in the last several streams as we've been working on UI things that has been troublesome is needing to uh, restart the container and not being able to leverage Vite's um, uh, hot reload as we're changing things. And so I think that I fixed that one by moving uh, VS Code to running inside of uh, uh, Windows subsystem for Linux and two um, there were some config changes right so I turned on HMR because it had been mainly turned off I removed the watch stuff that doesn't seem necessary anymore and then in Nginx I did um, add some Nginx settings for uh, support for web sockets passing to the front end, which is what HMR needed. Uh, let's, let's see if I had this, we have a little bit more space. There we go. So this seemed to be uh, sufficient to uh, allow the, the front end to pass through uh, the web socket stuff for HMR. So that's, that's good. All right, and with that, we can actually like work on front end things, hopefully. Um, I'm not sure why this was a dot. This was a square. So I changed the default width denied to 100 so that we could see something. That seems to have been lost. Let me refresh and see if that comes back. So, at least for now, there we go. It's gonna, it's gonna go away probably because we are triggering on scroll or resize or something. We'll have to figure out how that works. Um, but, oh yeah, that resize, that makes sense. That's fun. <laughs> okay, we'll have to figure out what we're doing here with the UI. But the idea here with this this timeline component is to get a visualization of a period of time. Uh, so let's let's take a look at this timeline component. <clears throat> Excuse me. So right now it takes a list of segments, and these are. Segments of silence, I think. These are like the silent areas that are detected. I think we might also want to have um, the timeline ref reflect the underlying, like however long the, the like video is. Like if the if the video is three hours long and the last silence detected is about halfway into it, then we want the timeline to, you know, show the full three hours and the timeline is uh, the silence uh, segment 
is uh, shown to be like halfway along the timeline. So to do that, we need to, need to have like a uh, a duration as well, I think. There we go, like that. Uh, this is gonna break things. Let's go over here. So, are we gonna have the information to know the duration? Uh, that doesn't exist. Record duration. So, record here in this context is the stream record. And I don't think the stream record has a duration. It could, though. Right, what do we know about the stream? We have all this information and we have like the video clips, um, the duration of the stream should just be the sum of the duration of the video clips, right? You would think so. I don't know if we want to do that on the front end though. We are scanning over video clips elsewhere. Well, I suppose if nothing else, the, um, hmm, it's kind of a, a way of thinking about it. It is a kind of an optimization, right? To be like, okay, well, right now we do have video clips, right? We have the list of video clips. We can, um, we could reduce, yeah. There you go. Uh, this is wrong though, right? Because reduce takes, uh, is the first argument the accumulator? It could be true. ACC plus clip duration. There you go. Of course, duration is not right either. Or at least it's not. There we go. We need to do this. Uh, unfortunately, we're not getting a lot of help here because we, like, record here is just like a RA record type. So it doesn't know what fields are present on inside of record or inside of video clips. So we're not getting a lot of help from TypeScript uh, there, but it's okay. So that might actually work. <laughs> uh, if nothing else, uh, we do need a duration here. I guess we can, here's something fun we can do. We can go back over to here. Uh, inspect. Let's dock this back on the on the right hand side again. I think. Let's go over to. Okay. Trying to click this. Interesting. Firefox doesn't like me right now. Apparently. Oh yeah, I think it's maybe frozen yep all right well stand by hmm boop, boop, boop. oh it's back all right can I can I do the thing I wanted I'm trying to get into the React dev tools. And it doesn't seem to want to let me do that, which is kind of annoying. Um, that's our right extension, right? Why, why, why no work Firefox?
today it is decided that the React Dev tools are not going to work. That is unfortunate. What's going on over here in the console? Yeah. Normal stuff. It's very odd, right? I'm clicking the little double arrows here and there should be a thing that pops up here. And yet there's not. Aha, components. I just needed to, you know, turn it off and on again. <laughs> All right, so duration, uh, 14,706 seconds. That is a plausible number. What is that in like hours? 14,706 divided by 60 seconds in a minute. 60 minutes in an hour four hours okay yeah so this would have been like a four hour stream all right so that number is right that's good um like i said that uh i think i said the opposite of what i meant right so this is not optimization this is the opposite of optimization this is totally unoptimized and probably a really bad way of doing this Potentially, every time we render this UI element, we are iterating over the list of video clips and doing math. And um, probably somewhere, maybe on the back end when we're retrieving the record for the stream, we could just have that information cached. Now, but caching is a kind of optimization. And I'm not sure where the best 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 place to cache that is like how um when is the best time to like calculate that value when is the best time to save it when is the best time to update it those are all questions that one wants to answer um and so i'm just trying to defer that because that's like a whole separate thing for now so we'll do We'll, we'll take the easy route, <laughs> not the efficient route, but the easy route for now. Uh, and that's, that's kind of what we're doing a lot, a lot of this. We're just trying to put together something that somewhat works and we'll, you know, if there are performance problems, we can, we can fix them later. All right. So. That was all a roundabout way of getting a duration here so we can have a timeline that makes sense. Now there's a lot of behavior behavior that we got because Copilot just wrote this for us and we're going to need it, but we aren't going to need it now. So what I'm gonna do, the first thing I'm gonna do here, I think is I'm going to disable um, a lot of this code. Is there a, is there a keyboard shortcut? to uh, comment out. Uh, Shift Alt A. There we go. Now handle wheel. So why why are we why are we doing event depth prevent default here? And then handle scroll. Okay, so I think I'm just gonna comment out all of these. Shift Alt A, yeah. There we go. And we're just going to uh, do some console logs here. So we just have a sense of what's going on because we are going to want to um, handle these events somewhere here uh, but clearly things are kind of broken right now like um, it seemed like resizing yeah handle resize yeah so we were listening to a resize event also and trying to resize things and that was not working so let's just we're just commenting on all that uh, and 
kind of the next thing we want to do is actually get the visualization part to work. So let's see here. Let's let's actually do things, huh? Uh, right, so this is why I wanted this to be separate window. There we go. And then we'll uh, do that. That's the wrong button. That moves it to a different screen. All right. There we go. So, um, what are we doing here? We have an SVG element here that we're um, rendering into the DOM, and we have a G element. And then what we're doing is we're saying for each segment, we're gonna create a rectangle. And the, so X, Y, width and height, um, so segment start is X1, Y1 is zero. So we're making a rectangle that should be hmm. Let's uh let's inspect the DOM here. This should, this should be interesting. So let's see what's actually being rendered here. So we have a bunch of rectangles. Yes. So the numbers here, these are, um, I think we, two weeks ago, we were talking about using D3. And one of the reasons to do that is there's a lot of stuff built in, in terms of like dimensional transformation in D3. So um, a lot of things, like if you look at example code, it'll be like, here's your data, and now transform the values in the data into be values in kind of a uh, a screen space, right? So we have a bunch of data that's, you know, numbers that represent number of seconds. And what we want to do is we want to translate that into numbers that represent um, a distance inside of our SVG element. So like a number of pixels, let's say. Um, now, I wonder, let's, um, do I have a tab already that has stuff about SVG open? No, let's, let's do um, SVG rect. I think there's a way to define, like we're defining width and height here for the SVG element, but I think there's a way to, um, to find kind of a relative coordinate. Hmm. Google is being really slow right now, apparently. Just checking to see if my internet is okay. Google's not working. It's the end of the world. <laughs> uh, hmm. I'm not going to use Bing, I guess. Maybe. Let's see. Oh, look. Uh... Trendy now, interesting. Uh, MDN, please. Thank goodness. I don't like how it opened a new tab. Uh, rect, or no, probably just, let's look at um, SVG. Probably just wanted to look at the element. Attribute references, there we go. Um, Uh, 
Bee box sounds familiar. Deprecated. Ooh. Um. It's sometimes challenging. Like I know there's a thing. I just don't. I don't know what it's called. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, what is DX? DX is shift. Yeah, position. Yep. Um, there's something about SVG and coordinates. element the G SVG elements is a container used to group other oh G stands for group that probably makes sense uh, view box there it is view box okay there we go so that gives us something to go off of it's all coming back to me now so what we want to do is essentially define like the view box is kind of the the SVG element, however many, however many pixels it's taking on screen, the coordinates within it are relative to the size of the view box. So what we want to do is something where we say, um, we probably do something like const uh, view box. Uh, height isn't super important, but we'll, we'll make it cost for it anyway. And then the width could be duration. That's interesting, right? So then the number of seconds the entire video took is the relative width of the whole thing. That means then that we don't need to transform the X value or the width of the rectangles because the overall width of our SVG element represents the whole length of the video. So that could be good. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how the, like the, the, the zoom and stuff is going to work in that, but whatever let's 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 roll with this for a little bit so the next thing we need to do is we need to actually add view box there we go and so that should mean that yeah we can see things <laughs> we can see things uh, there uh, so the height is interesting. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. So the Y1 should be 0. Y2 I mean I guess, but this is wrong. Like I mean, that's the same thing, right? Because Y1 is zero, so this is just height. But this should be 100. So many notifications. Uh, height should be 100 here. Right? Because that's what it starts as. View box height is 100. So... I mean, technically, we could also do this here, just to keep it all even. Y. So then the rectangle should be the height of uh, the the viewport, the view box. So I'm not sure why it looks like this. Like we should see lines, like yeah. So 
hard to see. We can make it bigger. But like this should go all the way to the top at the bottom, I would think, unless we are not doing something right with this rectangle, which is also possible. Let's go look at what the actual docs say for a rectangle. Uh, X width height RX. Yeah, that's radius. Um, X coordinate of the rect length or percentage Y width height. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. But if the view box height goes from zero to 100 and the height of this is 100, then why is it not like, why doesn't this show up as a, as a, a vertical line essentially that's a little wide? What are we actually rendering here? So Y zero, height 100, fill blue. Is there something, width height, width height, 100, 100, view box, zero, zero, that 100. No translation, no scale. Is it something to do with the Y, what if the Y was 100? What if the Y was 50? Where does it show up? Where does it, where, where is it visible? It's not. Oh, there's a bunch of ones that we can't even see because they're too narrow, right? But this one is visible. What if this one had a Y of 50? It's a little lower. Interesting. Is this transform doing something odd? Why are you like this? Overflow doing something odd? X, Y, height. Interesting. Okay, so let's go back to the, the docs on uh, Viewbox. I feel like I've missed something important. Okay, the Viewbox attribute defines the position, dimension, and user space of a SVG viewport. The value of the Viewbox attribute is a list of four numbers, min x, min y, width, and height. The numbers min x and min y represent the top left coordinate of the viewport, uh, okay, that makes sense. Uh, width and height represent uh, its dimensions. These numbers, which are separated by white space and for comma, specify a rectangle and user space, which is mapped to the bounds of the viewport established for the associated SVG element. Not the browser viewport. What if we don't use percentages? Uh-huh, uh-huh. What is a marker? I'm curious about that. For SVG box defines the position dimension for the content of the SVG elements. Yeah. Marker element defines a graphic use from drawing arrowheads or poly markers on a given path line. Interesting. Not what I'm after right now. Um, view box, zero, zero, width, height. That's right. What 
What if we temporarily... Let's go back to the... Uh, oops. Let's go back to the browser here. What if we get rid of the uh, width and height here? Okay, that looks like that. Right. Uh, and again, the the reason these segments look weird is because we've messed with the numbers here in a couple of places. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, that... That makes sense because the height. I, okay, so we can't we can't cheat and make it stretch the uh, the vertical dimension by setting the height of the SVG. Apparently, so if we want it to be taller, we have to use something besides one hundred. Okay. Um, we probably want to actually make that configurable. Nah. Let's do this. Let's, um, I mean, I kind of do. Like, this value needs to be changeable for the V-Box. Okay, we're, we're just gonna do this. Uh, not width. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, that, that might make sense. Let's see how that goes. Huh. Right, so that changed the height there. It did change the view box value. It doubled it. If we if we remove this height, how does that change things? How do we scale this? I mean, I guess we use scale, right? Maybe using width and height on the SVG is just not going to work. Let's try doing this. Hey, look, we have a timeline. Now, there's a lot of work for a little thing, but that's how it goes. That's just how it goes. Mm. So what's really cool is like, just like looking at what we're rendering here, the, the graphic, we can see some interesting things. Like we can see here some big segments uh, hey, uh, Itherek, <laughs> how's it going? How often do I stream Rust? Um, I, yeah, I guess it's not been a lot of Rust today, but, uh, this project, doing fine, you, doing good, doing good. Um, I, I'm, I do coding streams on Sundays, although I did, I did miss last Sundays because I was, uh, not feeling great, but, um, doing better. I, um, this project is mostly Rust. We're just kind of focused on some front end stuff right now, but like all the back end services are all Rust, uh, based containers right now. Hey, thanks for the follow. It's the act just followed. 
appreciate it. Um, so like we have a bunch of different AP, like microservice API things that are all Rust um, microservices. So they're using Axum. Uh, some of our stuff is using Redis. Some of it's using Postgres. You're starting to learn Rust. So I'm trying to find all the Rust streamers you can. Yeah, uh, Rust. It's um. It's a language that I've liked for quite a while. That I've just not, not had. I've not had a lot of um. Opportunities that are not the right word, but it, it's something that I've um, not put a lot of focus in. And then the reason I didn't use you for the front end, uh, just like using Rust for the backend services was like enough of a stretch. Uh, and like this, uh, using TypeScript was kind of like, uh, okay, well, here's something I'm more comfortable with using TypeScript and um, React Admin and that style of thing is something that I have used quite a bit in the past. Um, I I don't, like professionally, I have done a lot of front end stuff in the past, but it's been quite a while. And so React Admin is, oh yeah, so React Admin is a, um, it's like a, I guess you could call it a framework, but it's a it's a uh, it's an npm package you can install into your React uh, based front end application that gives you a bunch of um, components to build like CRUD style interfaces. So like all of this is React admin. So we have like we use components that find what the different resources are. So in this case, video clips, streams, episodes, topics, transcriptions. And then you define like a list view. And then in the list view, you define like what the different fields are. Um, and then you can define like an edit view or a show view and what fields go in there. And it's really customizable because it's all just like um, React components. Um, and then it has like a pluggable um, data provider service. Oh, hey. Uh, r 4 vv it's been a while since I've seen you uh, around. Reminded you of Trimmer.so, what's that? Uh, oh, React components to build charts and dashboards. Yeah, yeah, like, um, that was something that, uh, 20 plus open source components built on top of Tailwind CSS. I've not really done anything with Tailwind. Um, and honestly, grabbing like a an existing component would have been the smart thing to do for what I'm currently working on, making this this timeline. Um, but I kind of wanted to do some actual like proper fun. And, yeah, movie looks so dated now. Yeah, that's fair. You see it a lot. I've been using it for a long time as well. Um, there's some customization options and things you can do with movies. So you could probably make it look different. Um, this looks a lot like the Google API GUI. Yeah, I mean, it's all, um, so React Admin uses the Material UI library, um, MUI, as uh, Arn there says. What am I doing with Rust? Uh, right now, <laughs> it's going on behind the scenes. Um, oh, where's my Docker stuff? All right, so we have a bunch of backend services that are responsible for like um, taking the the videos and um, uh, it's much easier to look at if it's full screen. Yeah, there we go. All right, so like Stream Ingestion API uh, is scans my disk for video files, uh, gets them into the DB. Uh, Silence Detection API does some stuff with um, uh, FFmpeg like it, it just shells out. Like a lot of the things that I'm doing right now are just Rust, Rust uh, APIs that shell out to FFmpeg to do things. Uh, yeah, I mean that that's kind of part of it. The idea is essentially to do all the things that I don't like doing with like getting video files that I'm recording from my streams, um, slicing them up into VOD 
like segments that I upload onto YouTube, um, adding, basically all these things are things I wanna do, right? Um, so track the locally recorded clips from a stream, generate a set of episodes from the stream, episode transcription. I built that as a SAS in November, December, but they never added billing to it. Yes. Uh, it's been a while since I've done any kind of billing related things. Um, when I, I used to work at the startup and I like, it was a contract gig for, I don't know, like six months. And then I left and they pivoted and I came back. And the first thing I implemented for them was billing. Uh, we were using Stripe. This was like 10 plus years ago. Was it Stripe? No, 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 no. Chargeify? Might have been Chargeify. Uh, and then like all my projects do with me losing interest. Yeah. I mean, what what's neat, what I like about like streaming these projects is that um, it gives me like a, a defined period that I'm working on a project. Um, and I do occasionally work on these projects off stream, but it's mostly just like on stream. So, um, you know, it's just the designated period to work on the project and then. Uh, I didn't start with Rocket. I think someone mentioned Rocket on stream, maybe? Um, like, I feel like I pulled up, I think we pulled, pulled up a couple of things when we were just starting this project. Um, this, there was a first version of this, um, uh, uh, even, you know, earlier version of this that I did with Django, just trying things out. And then we started talking about doing Rust and then, uh, I remember pulling up a couple different things. I probably, yeah, I do remember pulling up Rocket, but I don't think I've done anything with it. Um, but right now, I'm just trying to do a little bit of front end stuff so we can see kind of the results of all the rest stuff we've done so far. Um, and so we can see, hey, look, we've, so this is like a four hour stream. So there's a bunch of stuff that we need to have here, like, when did these things occur? Like how long was this thing? Um, being able to like zoom in, hover in, etc., uh, etc. Et but we can see like these blue segments here are the big, uh, these are probably the, the, the breaks. So this is a good timing. Um, usually I, I, I normally stream for three and sometimes four hours at a time. And what I will do is I will uh, take a break for a few minutes, about every hour, um, just so that I can refill water, stretch my legs, those sorts of things. And the convenient thing about that is that uh, when we look at the silence detection for the video, you can see where the breaks occurred. These, these, these larger blue segments are likely where those breaks were. Uh, of course, I could use like the, the stuff on Twitch to add a marker to the stream, but uh, that wouldn't be in the video file. So that's, that's that, and that would be a thing I would have to remember to do. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so uh, that break is coming up here in a minute. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, so yeah, it, it is cool to like visually see the, uh, the result of like, I mean, FFmpeg is doing the hard work here to find the uh, the, the silences, and it, you can see it's it's spotting some like little little ones as well. This is just me not talking for like two two seconds, basically. Um, probably what we want to do is adjust the um, the granularity of the silence detection. Hmm. Let's think about that. Yeah, 
how are we controlling that right now? I think here in Stream Silence Detection Input. Yeah, you were surprised how many Docker images. Well, I decided to take kind of like a... And this, this word is really over overloaded and mocked and all that stuff, but kind of the microservice approach. So like every single separate kind of thing that I want to do, I'm just making a separate API and a separate service running to do that. Do you need to do that? No. You could have an API running in a single server that's doing all the things. Um, so we have the, the Postgres DB and the Redis DB and the front end, and those definitely make sense as a separate <laughs> container for each of those. And the rest of the thing, well, and Nginx too, kind of proxying uh, makes sense. Uh, which base image did I use? So I think I'm just using the Rust base image. Um, but what I have is I have a Docker file and then what, I, what I'm doing is I'm passing in, so I have a docker file.rust here. And let's install that into WSL. Um, so I'm using the Rust base image. And then I have like multiple stages here for building it, uh, for building a, the service image. And then I'm using Debian as the runtime base. Um, and so then I'm, what I'm doing is I'm parameterizing the Docker file with service name. Yeah, yeah, all of this is in the uh, glowing telegram GitHub repo. I should have a command that links that, but uh, I don't think I do right now. All right, we got like 20 seconds before Twitch is gonna wanna run the ad. So uh, here's the link to that. I'll be back in just a few minutes uh, and we'll continue uh, working on this project, BRB.